So for anyone who doesn't know me, my name's uh, Stuart. I'm one of the elders here. I'm just going to kick this a bit further to the side because I tend to move and I will uh, trip over. Um, and so last week we started a new series looking at the book of Amos. Um, and today that looked at the first two verses. First of all, I, I, well, I'm not going to apologize, but for those of you who have watched last week's sermon, you'll see that was also me. And if you're here next week, you'll see online that it's also me. Um, and so today is not actually supposed to be me preaching, um, but the Challoners were due to have a new foster child. Um, and for COVID reasons, that's not quite happened, but Annabelle wasn't um, able to prepare. So um, if you don't like my preaching, uh, very much apologies that you've got three weeks um, on the bounce. Um, and we've also got one of the cheeriest um, passages in the Bible. Now, um, you'll see it's titled The Six uh, Deadly Sins. Um, I've done a PowerPoint today because uh, we haven't used PowerPoint a lot recently, but there's quite a lot in it. Um, it's quite tricky, and I thought it might actually be a more helpful way to see the structure. And because there's quite a lot of slides, I'm going to try to click it myself. Now, if you've been at Woody for more than a few years, you'll know that this is fraught with risk and difficulty. So if it works, it works. If not, I'll just have to keep um, asking Judy to click on. So this is the second in the series of Book of Amos. So before we get going, um, does anyone know who this is? Does anyone know who this is? Yes, Harry Styles. Um, if you don't know who Harry Styles is, um, speak to my daughter um, because she is a super fan. Um, if anybody, you don't even know who he is, but if anyone knows how to get two tickets to his gig at Wembley Stadium on Saturday the 18th of July, come and speak to me because after, uh, June even, after a lot of time in Ticketmaster queue um, not long ago, um, we haven't got tickets uh, and that is um, the, yeah, a big deal in our house. Um, but he's Harry Styles um, and we'll come on to him again at the end. So for those um, who didn't watch last week, here's a very brief recap of the first couple of verses of this book and the, and the context. We're in the 8th century BC, about 750 years before Jesus, and the 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel uh, split about 150 years before into a northern and a southern territory. So the yellow um, hopefully, is it yellow on your screen as well? Yeah, the kingdom of Judah. There's two tribes there that are still loyal to Jerusalem. They worship Yahweh. Uh, and you can see Jerusalem with a little star in kind of the northern part of the yellow block. And the blue area, uh, the kingdom of Israel, is the other ten tribes who broke away under the kingship of Jeroboam I. And they have drifted away from worshipping Yahweh. They um, have set up two um, new kind of shrines. Um, the temple was in Jerusalem, and King Jeroboam set up uh, essentially new religious practices. And that's been going on for 150 years, so it has some kind of tradition. And one of those is at um, Bet El, it's shown on there, or it's often referred to in the Bible in sort of anglicized version as Bethel. And we have this guy, Amos. He lives in a place called Tekoa, just south of Jerusalem, um, not far from Bethlehem. And he is from the southern uh, kingdom, and he is frustrated with what is going on in the northern kingdom of Israel. So he wanders along up to Bet El and stands on the steps of the shrine and brings a whole series of words of judgment to the Northern Territory. And that is kind of where we're going to pick up the passage today. And there's kind of a whole series of pronouncements and judgments um, for, that Amos brings to the North. And last week I talked about how there is um, no love lost between the North and the South. So you can imagine uh, it's, you know, I alluded to, you know, someone from the EU coming and standing on the steps of Parliament and telling the Brexiteers what for. Or maybe it's Boris Johnson going to the Scottish Parliament and telling them what he thinks and how he thinks they should govern Scotland. And it doesn't always go down particularly well. 
So um, it's a longish reading today. We're going to read all of chapter one and the first three verses of chapter two. Right, Amos chapter one. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. He said, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire upon the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. I will send fire upon the walls of Gaza that will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron till the last of the Philistines is dead, says the sovereign Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood. I will send fire upon the walls of Tyre that will consume her fortresses. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of, for three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion. Because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. I will send fire upon Teman that will consume the fortresses of Bosra. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders. I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because he burned as if to lime the bones of Edom's king. I will send fire upon Moab that will consume the fortresses of Kerioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. I will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with him. Not the easiest passage to sign. <laughs> um, not the easiest passage to preach on or to understand. I am immensely thankful 
to a guy who goes by the name of uh, Motya, who wrote a commentary on this, uh, to be able to bring you anything coherent that makes sense. But what we've got is six words of judgment here, and you can see there's a similar pattern or style to the structure in those words. Recurring uh, phrases, the bringing of fire for three sins, even for four. And they're for six different places. Um, so on this map, we can see the surrounding nations around the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. The first word is to Damascus in the north east. And then the second word is Gaza in the southwest. And then to Tyre, which is in uh, the Phoenician states. And then to Edom, to Ammon, and to Moab. And as I mentioned last week, what Amos has done is use a clever tool here to engage his listener. He's gone into this foreign land and he's then pointed out all the flaws of the neighbours that encircle the, their nation. And it's quite, some people often enjoy it, don't they? Having the faults pointed out to their, of their rivals. You can engage with that. But as we'll see next week, the net kind of closing in on Israel and then Amos hits them much closer to home. Now what's interesting is all of these six nations are not nations that follow or worship Yahweh or recognize who he is. But that does not mean they're not subject to judgment. Whether we believe God exists or not has nothing to do with whether he exists or not. And I think that's really interesting in today's society. You'll often read things and say, oh yeah, but I don't believe in God, so God doesn't exist. That's not how it works. And Amos is preaching some really significant kind of monotheistic theology here. There is one God. It doesn't matter which God these nations worship and they will have different religions and different idols and different shrines that they worship at. But they were still answerable to the one true God, Yahweh. There is one God over the whole earth and all are answerable to him. And it also talks of the importance of conscience, the fact that we still know right and wrong, whether we have the scriptures or not. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses from the book of Romans, uh, Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. And in fact, the beginning of Romans, Paul is essentially lifting straight out of Amos. But this is verses 14 and 15. And this is a, a bracketed section. It says, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. When it talks about a law to themselves, it's not kind of the modern phrase of a law unto themselves when you kind of just do your own thing. It's saying they actually have the law within them already. We are created in God's image. He's placed that in our hearts. And whether we worship God or not, there's some sense of a moral compass built into our conscience. And so right here in this passage, we see there is one God a God who sees and a God who doesn't let injustice go unpunished. In verse 2, it talked about from the pastures to the top of Mount Carmel. There's a metaphor for totality from the valley floor to the top of the mountain. So that's the, the context. And then we see this repeating phrase, for three sins, even for four the three represents completeness, like a fullness of sin. And the fourth is an overflow. There is an excess of sin that has led to judgment. A tipping point has been passed. God has been patient, but this is just too much. 
and the six nations where they each had a passage uh, of judgment uh, pronounced on them. There are six different sins and they come in three pairs. We've got some relating to war crimes, relating to slave trading, relating to promise breaking, relating to persistent hatred and atrocities against the helpless and even the dead. And so we're going to look at these six briefly um, and see what they tell us and what they speak to us today. So the first is Damascus, this area in the northeast. And there had been a military campaign some 50 years earlier. And they have mistreated people significantly in this military campaign. And maybe many people think that, well, in war, you can do anything. But actually, there are limitations on how we should treat people. And they cannot be set aside even in war. That doesn't justify exceptional measures. And we see that on our TVs right now in Ukraine. War crimes being committed. So whilst some men may think that it is okay to mistreat other humans, God is saying that is not okay, not even in war. We are not to treat people as things. We are not to dehumanize them. There is an absolute moral principle that Amos is setting out. And so in the passage, it talks about threshing. That was something that you did to a thing, to a crop, to separate the wheat from the chaff. And what Amos is saying is there will be judgment for what they did. This is not acceptable, even to your enemies, even in war. You must not treat people as things. People are made in the image of God. This whole series of judgments, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, is about how we relate to other people, how we relate to one another. So this first pair is about people we don't know, our enemies even, in war. And then the second is Gaza, down in the southwest, where there was slave trading. I mean, the slave trading mentioned in three of these passages, but specifically, it's relating to Gaza, is talking about how we relate, essentially, in business, in the workplace, in how we treat people. There is slave trading going on, and they are prioritizing uh, profit over human welfare. We've gone from the battlefield to the boardroom. Gaza is a major trading center. And so maybe today we think about exploiting people. And again, in our news over recent years, we see companies like Amazon and Sports Direct and and many others as we've sort of developed the gig economy. How do we treat workers? And we see modern slavery, you know, that is clearly criminal. We see human trafficking. It's really important to think about how we treat people in the workplace, customers, suppliers, colleagues, whatever your workplace, you will know who they are. Do we treat people as people or as assets to be exploited? Increasingly, you're not referred to as a person in work anymore. A few years ago, it was human resources. Now it is talent. And if you think back to the parable of talents, that's something that you invest to make a profit. And maybe we lose uh, human capital is the other word that kind of gets bandied around in uh, my work environment, as if it's just something that you deploy to make profit. We must not prioritize profit over human welfare. So they're the first two. People we may not know, our enemies, and those that we come into contact with in a work or trading environment. The next pair are about people that we do know. So we're now looking up in the north and to Tyre. And both Tyre and Gaza were involved in the slave trade with Edom, which we'll come on to in a minute. But there's an additional issue here that is pointed out by Amos. There has been 
clearly an issue in terms of the way that they are carelessly leading to human suffering. But what God is looking at was the breach of their treaty obligations. They have broken their word. Now, actually, in the um, commentary, it was saying there may be some situations where it is okay to break a promise, but only when keeping the promise would do more harm than breaking it. And one of the examples, if you think of the New Testament, is where King Herod was tricked into bringing the head of John the Baptist on a plate. And they were saying, in that example, you should be able to say, no, that I'm not going to keep the promise I've made. There may be a consequence for breaking that pledge, but if it will bring more harm, you shouldn't. But it is different when you are just breaking a promise for your own self-interest. When we give our word, and this is, you know, runs through the whole Bible, that needs to be maintained. And you mustn't break an agreement for self-interest or self-advantage. And that is what Amos is pronouncing to Tyre. The other one in this pair is then <coughs> in the south to Edom, the other partner in this slave trading relationship where they have allowed hatred to live in their heart. So whilst they're involved in this slave trade, they're charged with an entirely different transgression that concealed in their hearts is anger and that out of that has sprung a series of outward acts of aggression and spitefulness. And the key challenge there is that when we are harboring hatred, we don't allow forgiveness to flow in. Forgiveness does not flow out. There is a lack of compassion with how we treat others. Maybe we forget our own position and the wrongs that we have done and we become only obsessed about the wrong that someone else has done. And actually what it means is we are trapped and we don't allow, and we then cause damage to others. We need to forgive is the lesson for us. We need, even when there is deep-seated bitterness from some wrong that has been done to us, we need to forgive, lest we damage others. And now we're on to the last pair of sins. And this is to do with the balance between the strong and the weak. And we've got two sins against the most vulnerable, against the unborn child and against a dead body. Where one poor party is helpless, the other ought to act with compassion. The law that was given to Moses made it obligatory to act on behalf of the afflicted and the helpless. The kings of Israel, and this was the term in the commentary, mixed bunch though they were, were noted for their mercy. Now, I'm, um, I think what's really important to recognise here is we read lots of the Old Testament and it feels quite merciless at times. The whole way of life is barbaric, and it was. And actually what we see with many of the ways that the nation of Israel and through the, what God has given to Moses, is quite different. It's suggesting a different path. It still seems to have quite a lot of violence, but compared to what was going on around it, it's radically different. Now, I've been reading this book, um, or I haven't read as much as I would have liked to, um, by a guy called Tom Holland. Uh, as Martin said, it is not the Spider-Man Tom Holland, it's the historian Tom Holland. Uh, believe it or not, this is a Sunday Times bestseller. Um, but this is actually looking at the role of Christianity in totally changing the Western mindset. And the fact that, because before that, there was no other society that wasn't barbaric, that did, that kind of offered compassion in any meaningful way. It's a fascinating book, because what was going on before Christianity was just nation against nation. And almost you can see the, the early stages as we've drifted away from Christianity in many of our nations to see the role, the rise of barbarism and the maltreatment of other people. 
it's quite easy to see. So if you want to know more, but so what we've got in this society, we've got a really barbaric society and we can see that. And God is saying there is a different way. The prophets in many ways were a part of the social conscience to remind Israel they should be living differently. So we've got Ammon and they are being charged with killing unborn children as unsavory as that is. And this is not a preach on the rights or wrongs of abortion at all. It's nothing to do with that. This was to do with them uh, at war and seeking to expand their boundaries. And they were just treating people with the grossest of indecency. And in this one, there is an even greater focus on the punishment that this nation will receive. The inrushing enemy, the tempest and the whirlwind. These are symbolic of divine antagonism. And there's nothing that moves God so much to punish as the wanton cruelty of the helpless. In Psalm 68, it talks about the father to the fatherless, the defender of the widow's cause. And that's what we see in these final two. The Ammonites are ambitious. They want to enlarge their, their border, expanding into Gilead. And what Amos it teaches us is we must limit personal ambition to ensure the rights of the helpless. Personal ambition is not wrong, that is God-given, but we're not entitled to run roughshod over others. And this is about looking to the future with children. And what it's saying is we must keep ambition within the bounds of kindness and mercy, but not just for now, but for the future. And you may not know, but in Wales, we have a Future Generations Commissioner. We have something called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And Wales is something of a pathfinder in this. And I work, uh, some of my work relates to the development industry. And it is frustrating to some people that seemingly stuff gets stopped because we're trying to protect and deliver a world that protects for the next generation. And it's still um, finding its way. But I think that would kind of accord with what Amos is saying here. Let's not just do things now, and we now know some of the damage of some of our actions, which our ancestors didn't know over the last few hundred years, but maybe we have to limit our ambition now to be kind to the people that will come after us. And that applies to us as a nation and as individuals. And then the final one, Moab. There was mistreatment of a corpse. They had lost in a war and they were trying to essentially exact some form of pointless revenge in a number of ways. They sacrificed the son of the king and they still lost, and then they go and they drag a corpse out of the tomb to damage it. And the commentators talk about how this is the effect, again, of ongoing hatred leading to irrational acts, a poisoning of the heart, and being obsessed about the past. And we need to renounce vengeance. Again, I was thinking about how that might apply in our society. And I guess the one that kind of immediately sprung to mind is our continuing obsession with World War II in this nation and how we relate to the German nation. And, even, and we were the victors. And still we seem to hold some kind of embittered desire for vengeance. But do we do that individually? Do we let the past have an ongoing effect on our heart? So judgment is pronounced by the prophet Amos. There is a warning, judgment of fire. Throughout all six, he says, I will send fire. This is symbolic. It's symbolic of God. We think of Moses and the burning bush. We think of the undying fire on the altar. It's symbolic of Yahweh and his holiness. And God always sends a warning in advance and Amos brings these words. But in Damascus, the threat was fulfilled about 50 years later. 
in the Philistine nature and in a uh, country where Gaza was an entire, they were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then there was another nation destroyed by the Assyrians. Judgment is real. Sin is not ignored by God. He does not turn a blind eye. The way man treats man on earth provokes a reaction from God. So just to sum up, everyone has the law written in their hearts. God is concerned for right relationships, that people are treated appropriately, whatever the circumstances. We must never treat people as things. We must never fail to recognise that people are created in God's image and we must never exploit and mistreat others. Not in the heat of battle, our enemies. Not in the workplace, colleagues and rivals, in the way that we do deals or make agreements. Not in our pursuit of personal or corporate or national ambition. We must keep our word. We must not hold on to hatred. We must not pursue vengeance, but practice forgiveness. So we'll go back to Harry Styles. Why did I talk about Harry Styles? Well, if you observe my daughter closely, you will see that she has all sorts of things with TPWK on. She's got it written on shoes that she's customised or beads on her laces or on her necklace. Because Harry Styles, he is no Christian as far as I'm aware. Um, And certainly uh, a lot of his thinking probably wouldn't align with mine on a whole raft of issues. But he has a phrase, treat people with kindness, TPWK. And all the Harry Styles mega fans have TPWK everywhere. Now, you can say it's a bit of a banal Instagram kind of uh, phrase. Theo Oliver would love it. (laughs) But what it is, is it's evidence that actually there is something written in people's hearts. If there is no God, why? Why treat people with kindness? Why would you? What is the point? Because actually people do have a conscience. There is some sort of moral compass. Even without the law, we know that we should treat people with kindness somewhere. It gets abused. It is fallen. Not everybody acts it out. We make mistakes and sometimes they end up compounding and we go a long way from it. But we should take pains to have a clear conscience towards God and towards men. And if that is true for those without the law, for those that didn't know Yahweh, didn't worship Yahweh, how much more is that true for us? And that is where the book of Amos is heading. And next week, we'll look at what Amos brings to the nation of Israel. And as I mentioned last week, as the church, we are held to even greater account because we know. But the good news is, It doesn't just end with judgment. I talked about forgiveness. There is hope of forgiveness because we can be forgiven. It's been modelled to us. Jesus came and died on the cross that we might be restored, that we might receive forgiveness, that there is hope, that whilst we will have made mistakes, We have a power that enables us to walk this out. And again, the end of the book of Amos brings that message of hope. So that's all I wanted to um, share this morning. I don't know if I've caused uh, Luke too many problems, but let's just um, take a moment of quiet and I'll pray. And then we'll figure out what uh, what we do next. So let's just have a moment of quiet. Father, it's a a heavy passage of these judgments being pronounced on the nations surrounding Israel and Judah. 
And on first reading, it seems really hard to extract clear meaning. But there is a theme that we must treat people the way you see people, the way you've created them in your image. And whether they be our rivals and our enemies, whether they be the people that we know in our family or the people that we do business with, or whether it be the unborn child or the weakest in our society, those in our past and those in our future. We are to treat people as people, to see the person, not treat them as an asset to exploit or as a thing that it doesn't matter if we damage. but we must treat people with care, with kindness, with mercy. So Father God, would you examine us now? That if this has brought things to the surface, that we might repent of where we have mistreated people or where we are mistreating people, where we know there is wrong that needs to be righted. Where we know that we've held on to bitterness that is now overflowing in anger or in aggression or mistreating of others for nothing that they have done at fault. Father, we want to heed the warning that you give and put ourselves right with you and right with others. So, Father, I just invite the Holy Spirit now to just be touching people as we pray. We thank you that we don't have to walk this alone but that you give us the power and strength and resources to be able to walk this out. That first and foremost, you give us the offer of forgiveness as we forgive others. Father, we don't want to live in fear of judgment. And so we thank you for Jesus. We know that sin breaks your heart. That sin brings your wrath. You are a holy God. So would you give us a right view of the sin in our lives, but also a clear view of the path to forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.